is called e-commerce at the WTO. What's going on? Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to thank our co-sponsors who are joining us in this experiment, and they are the Computer and Communications Industry Association, the Internet Society of Washington, D.C., the Center for International Governance and Innovation, the Institute for International Economic Policy, and the Web Foundation. We are so lucky and so pleased to work with them. So today we're really delighted to welcome Victor Do Prado, who's the director of the Council on Trade Negotiations Committee Division, WTO. He's gonna speak and then we're gonna open the floor up to your questions. And his remarks will cover the history, status, and future of the talks. Now, we're not gonna use the raise the hand, but you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you can see that there's a question and answer section. So good morning, Victor. We're ready. Okay, Susan, thank you very much. Good morning to all. Uh, very happy to be uh, here um, and very happy to accept this invitation uh, from uh, Susan to talk about uh, what is going on in the WTO on e-commerce. Let me start by the usual disclaimer because I'm a WTO officer and in the WTO, we are supposed to have no views uh, whatsoever. The WTO, as you all know, is what is called a member-driven organization. So I'm speaking strictly on my personal behalf. I'm not uh, speaking uh, on behalf of any WTO member, uh, and my views are not those of the uh, Secretariat. Uh, they're just uh, my own views, and I hope that I, I'll be able to do a factual presentation um, of what is going on, uh, and then happy to reply to some questions. Um, this uh, slide that you now have in front of you uh, has uh, two uh, sides, and I'm going to start with the left-hand side, where it says multilaterally uh, under work program. So what is happening multilaterally, that means what is it that has been there uh, and that all members uh, sign off to? Some of you may know since 1998, so it's over 20 years now, the WTO has had a work program on electronic commerce um, that was tied to, or that is tied to, a moratorium on uh, the imposition of duties on electronic transmissions. This moratorium was agreed at a ministerial conference here in Geneva in 1998, uh, at a time when the e-commerce landscape was very different than what it is now. But at that time, ministers decided to um, agree on a moratorium on uh, the imposition of duties on uh, electronic transmissions and to establish a work program. That work program um, was supposed to take place um, in four WTO bodies, namely the Council for Trading Goods, the Council for Trade in Services, the TRIPS Council, that's Intellectual Property, and the Committee on Trade and Development, and reports to the General Council of the WTO. Now, this moratorium has been, uh, was initially introduced for two years and has more or less been um, extended every two years with a few interruptions. Uh, and the last time it was extended was at the 11th Ministerial Conference of the WTO, which took uh, place in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in December 2017. Uh, since uh, that Ministerial Conference, which we refer to as MC11, um, there has been some discussion on the moratorium. Now, the uh, decision in Buenos Aires referred to an extension of the moratorium for two years until the following ministerial conference, which um, at that time everybody thought was going to take place in December 19. Now, there was a, an initial delay in the ministerial conference, the 12th ministerial conference. It was supposed to take place in Kazakhstan in June of this year. So in December of 2019, members in the General Council took another decision to extend again the moratorium until the 12th Ministerial Conference uh, and to have structured 
discussions on the moratorium. Um, we were supposed to have uh, a workshop on the moratorium uh, last week. Uh, it was postponed because of the virus. Um, and uh, members did want to have um, a conversation about issues such as scope of the moratorium um, and uh, then report to ministers at the ministerial so that ministers would be able to take a decision, an informed decision on whether or not to extend the moratorium and to um, uh, also extend the, the work program. We have recently received um, a couple of uh, submissions, and if Susan, you could move to the next slide. Yeah, this is the text, actually the text of the latest decision of 2019. And you see the last two paragraphs there refer to members agreed to the current practice of not imposing customs duties on electronic transmissions until the 12th Ministerial Conference, and it says that the General Council will report. And in the first paragraph, we say that the work program is going to be reinvigorated, that members are going to discuss issues such as scope, definition, and the impact of the moratorium on customs duties. Now, the next slide is the one that shows a couple of submissions by members, so a recent communication by India and South Africa. The most recent one is this document WTGCW798, which is early March, and a even more recent communication by a group of uh, some 11 countries. Um, uh, Switzerland is the one who initiated this uh, this communication and it was supported by others. Uh, also on the moratorium. Uh, there have been also quite a few studies by different international organizations and uh, think tanks. So UNCTAD has produced two studies on the impact of the moratorium. The OECD produced a study last year and so did uh, ICIPI. Um, and all of them having to do with economic losses from the moratorium and what is the um, what is the impact of the moratorium on um, on revenue loss for example and what is the impact for developing countries so we have quite a few uh, thought going on uh, both in terms of members and in terms of um, international organizations doing work uh, on the moratorium uh, now, we are trying to figure out how we can continue this discussion in the times of the virus. Now, if we can go back to the very first slide, Susan, because I'm going to go to the right-hand side now and talk about this joint statement initiative, which we call for um, ease of reference JSI, Joint Statement uh, Initiative on, um, on e-commerce. Um, this is an initiative that started in Buenos Aires in uh, 2017, where 71 members of the WTO signed a joint statement calling for exploratory work towards future WTO negotiations. Three WTO members uh, are at the helm of this initiative, Australia, Japan, and Singapore. Since 2017, uh, they have had nine meetings, and these meetings are open to all WTO members, even those who are not, who have not signed up to this, uh, to this initiative. And this initiative um, is something that, um, let's put it this way, is not surprising if you take, if you look at the, uh, the uh, chapters in regional trade agreements um, that cover e-commerce. Um, for example, the TPP or CPTPP, as it is called now, has a full chapter on e-commerce. Other regional trade agreements also do. We in the WTO have counted more than 60 regional trade agreements and bilateral trade agreements, FTAs, that have uh, some sort of provision on e-commerce. So it was natural that some of these members uh, wanted to discuss this issue um, also in the WTO. Um, last year in Davos, um, these members launched negotiations on 
trade related aspects of e-commerce. Uh, there are now 84 members from the 71 uh, original ones, uh, over 30 proposals and six focus groups. We're going to talk about these groups uh, shortly. Um, and they are now talking uh, uh, about um, specifics of e-commerce or trade-related aspects of e-commerce based on streamlined uh, texts. They have foreseen clusters of, of, of meetings uh, and the idea that members had before the ministerial conference was postponed was to have a, a streamlined and consolidated uh, text to be presented to ministers. Now, I must say that not all WTO members um, are in favor or support this initiative. Uh, some, uh, of course, raise lots of questions regarding um, whether uh, these uh, joint statement initiatives um, should be uh, taking place in the WTO. Um, that discussion is, is still ongoing. Now, Susan, if you go to the third or fourth, uh, yeah, that one, you see the names of the 84 participants. The ones in red are just the most recent ones um, that have been that have joined this initiative uh, since the beginning of uh, of this year. Um, a very um, yeah, pretty varied type of um, membership, um, cutting across uh, all continents. Um, um, and uh, the United States is there, China is there, uh, the European Union and all of its members, but um, not only Japan, uh, which is one of the co-conveners, Australia and Singapore, of course. Uh, and then more recently, we've, had, we've seen some uh, African countries also joining that uh, initiative. Some of them have not joined, but uh, are very active um, in the... Um, in, in, the, uh, in the conversations. Um, maybe the last slide now, uh, Susan, if I may. Um, and these are the focus groups um, of the joint initiative. And you will see the types of issues that are being discussed, uh, facilitating electronic transactions, um, e-signatures, e-payments, and, and et cetera, all of these uh, enabling digital trade or e-commerce, uh, that's the title of that focus group. The second one is uh, the focus group B on openness in uh, digital trade e-commerce is the one where very tough discussions take place because that's where you have flow of information. So data flow, are there going to be any restrictions on data flow? What's the, um, what is the rule that is going to apply be applied in the WTO to flow of information, um, so access to internet and data. And that discussion, of course, has a very uh, close link to the one in the next focus group, which is consumer protection, privacy concerns. So uh, business trust, clearly a, um, a dynamics there bet between privacy issues and uh, flow, free flow of information focus group D on uh, transparency, all of these cross-cutting issues, cybersecurity, capacity building, uh, domestic regulation, uh, focus group E, telecommunications. Um, so some WTO members participating in this G JSI would like to um, propose the updating of the telecommunications reference paper on services. Uh, and finally, um, market access, There's some uh, people proposing a revisiting of um, market access negotiations in goods, the information technology agreement, and in services. So I'll guess, I guess I'll stop here. This is uh, very comprehensive, uh, quite a lot to chew, but um, I guess it gives you a flavor of what is happening in the WTO just now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Victor. So we already have two questions. Um, so the first question, as you can see, I think everybody can see the question. So I'll just quickly summarize them. Um, someone is asking, can, can I get a copy of this? And we, we're gonna have a YouTube channel. So that's great, okay. Um, 
Second question is, given that MC12 has been postponed again, will the e-commerce moratorium be automatically extended? That's a very good question. Uh, and I would shy away from saying whether it's going to be extended or not. What I can say is that the decision that was taken by members in December of 19 says that the moratorium is going to be, is extended until the um, ministerial, the 12th ministerial conference. So I guess, it's a guess, I guess many members will claim that that means that the next discussion on the extension of the moratorium should be taking place uh, during the 12th ministerial conference. But I should also say that many members want to continue that discussion um, before the ministerial uh, conference. That was what was agreed that um, a, a substantive discussion was going to take place, including on the scope uh, of, the, of the moratorium. Thank you, Victor. Okay, um, our next question is, with the COVID outbreak, are the working group sessions expected to continue virtually? Yeah, we're working on that, not easy. The, um, there are lots of questions about working uh, virtually. I know that Australia, Japan, and Singapore are indeed considering having some virtual meetings of the JSI, but I, um, I don't have a confirmation that a meeting has been uh, scheduled as yet. Just to expand on that question, um, could you go over some of the possible barriers to that? For example, how do you hold a secure negotiation and ensure that members all feel comfortable that nothing said leaves the virtual room? How can well, that is one. That, that's one. That's a very good question, and I'll answer very rapidly because I see there are more questions here. The WTO, uh, each one of the WTO bodies has rules of procedure. Now, the e-commerce uh, moratorium and work program is under the General Council, and and the General Council rules of procedure say that the uh, meetings should take place in three working languages: English, French, and Spanish and that it should be held in private, namely confidential. Now, it's not easy to ensure meetings in three languages simultaneously uh, via um, a platform that is also uh, confidential. So there is, there is some technical work to be done there. Okay. Um, so or, or sort of, or, or else we have an agreement by WTO members to waive those rules to have discussions in English only and, and, and perhaps not private. Wow, that is so interesting. Um, okay. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm, I'm saying if, we, if you can't have that and people still want to have it, then something, something's gotta give, right? Some people are saying that they can't see the questions, so I'm going to read them out loud. I apologize for that. I, I thought everyone could see the questions and answers. But, um, okay, so our next question is, the EU seems very ambitious in e-commerce rulemaking. Can you talk a bit about the EU's negotiating tactics and agenda? Yeah, sorry. No, I I won't go into EU negotiating tactics. And agenda. Maybe you should ask <laughs> we'll have, that to we'll the. We'll try EU. to get an EU negotiator for another <laughs> that's session. That's um, <laughs> that's a much fairer way to do it. Okay, our next question is: Do you think there will be less focus on the trips NVC moratorium, which I think would be great mm -hmm. if you find that for the attendees? Um, quote unquote, we used to always negotiate them jointly, understanding they were politically linked. Yep, that political link has been there. So for those who do, do not know what this is, this is a moratorium that was also agreed back in time on uh, non-violation complaints. It's something very legalistic, but it has to do with uh, the agreement on intellectual property rights and whether or not uh, you can accept um, to a breach of that uh, or a complaint, a dispute settlement complaint, uh, even though there has been uh, no uh, violation of the agreement per se. So something that mirrors the, uh, 
the GATT. And the moratorium on non-violation complaints has been indeed extended uh, basically every time the uh, e-commerce non-moratorium has been extended. And the latest was indeed in um, December of 2019. Um, and even though they are legally not uh, linked, they are politically linked, as it were. Uh, what has happened in the recent years is that first you try to get an agreement on the e-commerce moratorium and when that has happened then an, the moratorium on uh, TRIPS non-violation complaints has also been agreed. So, uh, but he's asking um, how will they be linked in the negotiations? Do you, is there any sense of this? Does anyone know that yet? We don't know. No, we don't know. I mean, clearly, we, they are linked in terms of the multilateral work, right? If the question is, is, is there a link between the TRIPS non-violation moratorium and the joint statement initiative, that is a different story, and I do not see that link. Okay, here's another question, which um, might not be the most comfortable. Um, why is India not uh, participating in these negotiations? Um, I think India has some concerns about um, the, um, the rule making uh, in, in e-commerce. Um, but really, I mean, again, maybe it would be easier to ask an, an Indian delegate. I know the Indian ambassador is very articulate and, and um, and I know his views, but it would be perhaps interesting for you to invite uh, the, uh, the Indian ambassador and he can explain their, their views. That is a great idea and I would love to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any, are there just... Sorry, just, 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 to be, just to be true to India, the, you know, the, the concerns have to do basically with policy space and with what India and some other countries as well see as uh, rulemaking in an area that is not ripe for rulemaking, in their view. Thank you so much for that. Coming back to the e-commerce moratorium, what if it's not extended? Is there any effort to extend it on a plurilateral basis? Yes, there is. There has been talk about within the members of the joint statement initiative to extend it within that group. And mind you, several of the regional trade agreements that we have um, been aware of already contain um, moratoria on electronic transmissions that were agreed um, on a regional or on a bilateral basis. Okay. So for example, CPTPP already has a moratorium amongst those members. Okay, great. Um, in February, New Zealand, Canada, and Ukraine said they'd like to see the principle of transparency applied to the SL, including release of any consolidated negotiating text. So this, um, this uh, webinar uh, attendee wants to know, what kind of transparency do you think we'll see? Um, I guess I, I am aware of that uh, proposal. In fact, several members have mentioned that they would like to see a more transparent negotiation of the joint statement uh, initiative. And I, and I guess some of the other uh, members of the joint statement were not ready for full transparency. Um, I think they were considering, and I underline considering, uh, making a consolidated text um, uh, available uh, by the time of the ministerial conference. You know, that to me, given that cross-border data stores are built on trust and uh, that uh, trust is also key to the whole notion of trade agreements, this is such a great opportunity for the WTO to build trust in its actions globally and to build better understanding of how trade negotiations work, this could be the test case. Um, yeah, I, I take your point, Susan. 
the problem is that the WTO Secretariat is not at leisure to uh, publish a text if at least uh, one member is not in agreement with publishing that text. Right. Uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot do that against the will of the members. Yes. Okay. Are there any plans for, WT, for the WTO to start talks on data governance as an issue on its own? In other words, not necessarily related to trade and address as a global regulation of data protection related to global flows of data. Um, some of the data governance issues are somehow included in the JSIs, but there is no talk of having a um, conversation about uh, data governance per se. Uh, most of the members want to restrict the conversation to trade-related aspects of e-commerce and digital trade. But you will see that, I mean, it's unavoidable that when you start talking about data flow, a free flow of data, about server localization, about privacy concerns, those are some of the issues that are, that at least tangentially touch upon uh, the larger issue of data governance uh, and data regulation internationally. Thank you for that answer. Um, what options are there for the legal framework for the e-commerce JSI? For example, something like the procurement agreement, an MFN approach. Um, yeah, I have to shy away from, from that question. Members do not wish to discuss that uh, at this moment. They prefer to uh, discuss the substance and then get into the legal uh, architecture of the agreement. Uh, what I can tell you is that many members have been, and the secretariat, of course, have been talking about a lot about this and trying to uh, and trying to come up with um, with potential solutions. But it's this is you have to understand this is really a member-driven negotiation. It's the co-conveners plus the participants in the JSI who are leading this conversation, and they themselves prefer to have that conversation. Uh, on the legal architecture once the substance is, uh, let's put it this way, more mature. Um, thank you, Victor. There are some countries in Central America that have not joined the JSL for e JSI for e-commerce. Can you talk about how Central America as a region has been progressing on e-commerce? Well, I think it has been progressing a lot, and we see quite a few of the Central American countries uh, participating in the uh, moratorium discussions uh, and also on uh, the JSI. I can tell you, for example, Costa Rica is one of the most active members in that, uh, in that conversation. Panama, well, not really Central America, uh, but has also been uh, incredibly active uh, on uh, on e-commerce uh, issues, and I can tell you for sure that El Salvador, uh, that uh, Honduras uh, have all been uh, Guatemala have all been uh, interested in in this issue, even though not all of them participating in the um, in in the JSI. Thank you. Okay. Um, what types of WTO legal instrument could the eventual JSI agreement take? Well, that's the, the, same, the same reply as before, you see. Um, different different uh, options are out there. Uh, and again, the uh, co-conveners, the coordinators, prefer to have that discussion later on. But okay. yeah, I mean, people have, have in the questions already mentioned some of, some of them. Okay. Will competition issues be part of the e-commerce negotiations? Uh, I don't see competition issues there at this moment. That's a very short reply, I'm afraid. Uh, any other questions, Susan, that you can see there? 
Yeah. Um, I'm just checking here my list of 84 participants. I see El Salvador there as one of the, I see Honduras. So both of them are participating. Costa Rica is there as well. Uh, I don't see Guatemala. Yeah. And uh, an agreement in the joint Honduras statement. is there. Initiative can be reached. How would the plurilateral agreement operate within the legal architecture of this? <laughs> I see a lot of people interested in that. This is a fascinating issue. I know many lawyers have been scratching their heads about this. Uh, so have we. Uh, and again, uh, this is necessarily going to be something new. That's all, all I can say for, for the moment. Um, any more questions? Well, while we're waiting for some more questions, let me ask you one, um, which is, uh, I think, a difficult one. It seems to me when I did a word analysis of uh, the, the non-papers, it looked to me like some countries are negotiating goods and services delivered via the internet. And other countries seem to be negotiating e-commerce and data services. And what does that mean if there isn't a shared strategy for what they're negotiating about? Is that a problem or am I making this up? No, I don't think you're making this up, Susan. And it's a very difficult question. I don't know that everybody has the same view about the scope of the joint statement initiative. Uh, I think you're right. Some members are there and they have a specific interest on, let's put it this way, a traditional view of e-commerce, namely purchasing, um, purchasing goods uh, online or even purchasing some uh, digitizable goods online, so uh, music or, or, or movies. And some other members are rather thinking about a broad spectrum of activity of economic activity that takes place online um, including all types of different services that uh, that take place today and that are internet uh, based so not only uh, so physical goods that you order online um, or um, digitizable goods things that have become digital following the uh, the internet uh, development, but lots of services that are now rendered uh, online. And I think at some point in time, either they come to an agreement as to what is the scope of that, um, of, of, of these uh, negotiations, or else they um, find some flexible way to accommodate different positions. Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, here's some other. I think your image has frozen, uh, Susan. Are you there? For a consolidated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can everyone? Okay. To your understanding, are the co-convenience still aiming for a consolidated text by June? Um, I think they were uh, indeed aiming for a consolidated text by June at the ministerial. Now, given the fact that we have not had uh, meetings, the building has basically been shut down because of the, of the virus, uh, I, I think it would be difficult to meet that deadline. Not impossible, depending on when we can reopen the building. Uh, also, I mean, WTO, uh, ministerial conferences provide this type of uh, um, milestone that people look at um, to craft new agreements. If we don't have a ministerial conference happening in June, um, maybe some of that pressure has, has been withdrawn, hopefully not too much. And I do see members wanting to discuss some of these issues uh, virtually. But I would not be surprised if there's some delay 
on uh, producing a, an agreed consolidated uh, text. Thank you. Okay, our next question is, has there been any progress in negotiation on how different ideas on data localization policies can be bridged? As I understand this issue, some countries are insistent on mandating data localization while others want total free flow of cross-border data flows. Yeah, that's a very difficult issue and that's a good characterization of where things stand. Uh, all I can say at this moment is that this is a hot topic. It's being debated uh, uh, and there are indeed different views. So hopefully those views can be bridged somehow or accommodated. But yes, some uh, members do see as uh, server localization as uh, something in their competence and their right and others uh, point to the difficulties that this creates for data flow. Can I comment on that? I, I do find that a little bit bizarre, and it might relate to strategy, because all nations at times limit cross-border data flows, right? Information as example. Um, so maybe that is a strategy question. How will nations, will they use the exceptions or will they delineate when they can uh, in very clear rules? What, what's your sense of the strategy on that? Yeah, I think different people have different strategy. I mean, purely from a theoretical point of view, you can have two ways of looking at this issue. You can have a, sort of a, an agreement in principle that data flows freely and that there is no restrictions on, on free flow of data. And then you have um, so that would be the overriding principle. And then you have some exceptions to that. <clears throat> or, you can, or you could envisage something the other way around, namely provided you respect sort of issues like privacy concerns and et cetera, and they would be sort of the, the overriding consideration. So to the extent that those national concerns and, and sometimes supranational concerns are, um, are respected, that then you would allow uh, data to flow freely, right? So these are two different concepts, um, one way or the, or, or the other. Uh, and, and you would not be surprised if you think about, you know, some of the cultural differences that exist uh, with regards to uh, to privacy in different parts of the world uh, where uh, do some members uh, stand on on this matter right for some members privacy is the overarching consideration um, that uh, that should be treated like a human right for example and for some others it's the it it you know the data flow should be the overarching consideration and then uh, you would agree to exceptions. That is so, so helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Ready for some more questions? Yeah. And everybody, while we have you, thank you so much for your patience with this. No, um, my pleasure. Answering questions. Okay, so here we go. On privacy concerns, will the WTO be flexible to adopt international principles, or will it do it through cooperation with other organizations? I think we we will have to cooperate with with uh, whoever wants to cooperate with us, and I think this is an issue that we will all need to learn uh, more. Um, I think different countries are already talking about their different regulations on privacy concerns, uh, but yes, as I said, there are differences in the way. Uh, different populations look at these concerns. They're cultural, they're historical, uh, and I think we need to take them into account. Uh, and, and I think this is an area, if I had to say, one of the priority areas for this negotiation is for um, different countries to sit and have a conversation about, um, about their differences in, in privacy considerations. Okay. 
Our next question is, why is Unkhead so keen on destroying WTO commitments? Not sure I get that question. Yeah, I mean, probably based on some on on some views about Unkhead. I must say that uh, our relations to the colleagues in UNCTAD who are dealing with uh, e-commerce are very constructive. E-commerce has been, um, uh, UNCTAD has been staging this e-commerce week, which is uh, super useful. Uh, there are some interesting discussions that take place there. So um, I think e-commerce and, and the whole digital trade uh, area is one where uh, there's a lot of potential for cooperation between the WTO and UNCTAD. Absolutely. Thank you. Why are, what sorts of additional outside analysis or advocacy could help to move along the various WTO e-commerce initiatives? I, what advocacy, what was that before I didn't Analysis I didn't hear. or advocacy. Uh, analysis or advocacy. Um, I mean, understanding surely to me, what are the development aspects of uh, e-commerce is something that uh, would be super helpful. Uh, we cannot deny that there's a digital divide out there, that different countries are at different stages of development of um, e-commerce and, and the digital economy. Uh, and understanding these differences uh, would be incredibly helpful. And by the way, this is one area where I think UNCTAD and WTO can cooperate more. Um, you know, Surely understanding revenue implications is important. Understanding how e-commerce promotes certain kinds of business, the link between e-commerce and uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterprises, all of that uh, is, would be very, very helpful. Um. Could you, do, do the members of the WTO have a shared definition of e-commerce versus digital trade? And it, it, uh, the, it's still called the e-commerce negotiations. Will it continue to be called that? It's a big issue. We, we, okay. we, know, we know what the, you know, that the moratorium is on uh, e-commerce, so it's a custom duties to electronic commerce. Um, now, the JSI participants use e-commerce or digital trade, and sometimes interchangeably, sometimes uh, thinking that e-commerce is more limited than, than digital trade, uh, there, is no, there is no definition of uh, what digital trade is. Okay, thank you. Given the WTO's member-driven feature, is it a possibility that these ongoing negotiations will drag on if there's no agreement? Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at WTO uh, uh, pace, you know, sometimes I get people coming here to the WTO business and, and they say, so can we have an agreement by the end of this year? And I show them the Jura Mountains that are, you know, we can see from, and that's where they found the, the bones of the first dinosaurs. That's where Jurassic <laughs> comes from. I mean, the pace here in the WTO can feel a bit uh, glacial uh, sometimes, but hopefully this is not one of those. So hopefully we can get uh, people to agree. Clearly, um, yeah, some members are interested. Others are not. And I think we have to respect those views as well, that other members are not uh, joining this conversation and, and they, you know, they feel that this is not the time to do this. So we have to respect everybody's views here. And we, even within those who want to have an agreement, there are different, different paces. Okay. All right. Has there been any further debate and thinking on technological neutrality and how old GATS classifications and commitments apply to technologies and practices of more recent vintage? Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the so question. So he's saying like, um, so, you know, the notion that the technical neutrality is built into the gaps. And he's saying, but what do you do for new technologies that are dramatically changing practices? An example of that might be AI, if I may rephrase this question. Mm, yeah. Uh, 
tricky. We could speak for hours about this. Uh, what is the relationship between WTO agreements and the technology that allows or not trade to happen? And how is this changing now uh, that uh, we're using technology to do different things? Um, you know, there's, there's lots of, the more I read about this, the more I have questions myself. Uh, for example, are, and, and this is just a theoretical question, is a digitized book, sort of the ones that you read uh, in one of your handset tools, is, is that the same as a physical book? Well, yes and no, right? Uh, and some economists or lawyers will tell you that already the, well, the, ob the object, the objective is the same. So you're reading a book, whether you're reading a book in a, in a paper that you, that, that you have in your hands or in a, on a screen, it, it's, the same, it's the same purpose. But some people point out to the fact that, for example, the type of ownership between a, yourself and in a physical book and yourself and a digital book is not the same, right? Or, or music. Um, and very often you may be streaming, so you may be renting, not owning, not purchasing that, that thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, and a book, of course, if, uh, if you die, you're, you're going to leave it to whoever inherits your, <laughs> your, <laughs> your things, right? Uh, it's not necessarily the same for digital stuff. So there are all types of considerations. Uh, the, the economists will tell you that the demand is not the same because the price is not the same. So there are all of these considerations that... Um, that economists and lawyers are trying to, to grapple with. Fascinating new world, while all I can say. Thank you. Some countries want to see new restrictions on the disclosure of algorithms that could create problems for transparency required to regulate new AI systems. How can these two conflicting priorities work at the same time? Yep, very good question. And I think there will need to be some sort of balance found there. This is one of the areas where people are discussing, that people are discussing in the JSI. Well, that, but I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a reply. This is a really tricky question, really tricky. Um, I wonder how, how are you preparing members to understand these concepts? I would imagine many developing country members and, and industrialized country members are, for example, deeply concerned about the impact of smart manufacturing or 3D printing on uh, comparative advantage in manufacturing. What kind of work do you do to help countries understand these things so they can negotiate effectively? So we are of course, trying to uh, air these issues as much as possible. We have been receiving quite a lot of requests for technical assistance uh, from different uh, WTO members. Uh, we have been providing technical assistance and te technical assistance uh, means sending somebody to capitals or national or or regional workshop, uh, discuss all of these issues with, uh, with government officials. There has been a lot of interest on, on this in, in many parts of the developing world. Uh, and we try to promote uh, in-house uh, activities as well. So every time the, there is a cluster of meetings in the JSI, uh, we uh, have seen um, different think tanks and, and business associations also do uh, brown bag lunches, so lunchtime uh, workshops, uh, trying to talk about these issues uh, on a non-negotiating basis. So basically trying to have a conversation and understand already the vocabulary, which is very often people understand 
different things with the same words. So trying to get some sort of common understanding on, on concepts and definitions and trying to get people to uh, understand the, uh, the economic impact of these issues. And, and if anything, how do these things work? I mean, how do, what is an algorithm? How does it work? What is the importance of uh, server localization or not? All of these issues, just air them in, in a sort of a non-negotiating context. And there has been a lot of demand for that. Thank you. Our next question is, how will the World Economic Forum cooperate with the WTO to initiate, sustain, and finalize e-commerce negotiations? Well, the same, same as, as, as I was saying, the World Economic Forum is one of those uh, institutions that uh, produces uh, papers, produces analysis and studies. They also have um, uh, a group of people that uh, talk about e-commerce uh, very frequently. They have done some activities uh, together, for example, with the Graduate Institute here in the WTO, in, in Geneva as well, uh, and one of those uh, brown bag lunches. So, uh, they are clearly doing sort of uh, research and analysis on, on this, which may benefit, um, you know, a wider understanding of these issues. Okay, thank you. Do you think that to achieve convergence in contentious issues such as data flows and privacy, members would be more willing to agree on diluted weak commitments or would insist on strong binding language? Um, I don't know. I think there will be push for one and push for the other. And, and this is the beauty of a negotiation. Some people will want binding rules and some people will want less binding rules. And I guess the beauty of, uh, of a negotiation is trying to find the middle ground, something that everybody feels comfortable with. But um, yeah, those, that, that dynamics is very much there. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think the WTO is powerful enough to influence e-commerce and include an e-commerce agreement? WTO is not powerful at all. It's the members of the WTO that are powerful. So it's it's up to them. <laughs> okay. So it's whatever it's whatever the members want, right? On the telecommunications reference paper, what issues are to be negotiated for the for updating of the same in GATS? Yeah, well, clearly some uh, of the market access issues in uh, the telecoms updating, because the telecoms reference paper, if you recall, is, was negotiated back in, um, back in the 90s. Clearly, if you look at it, there's other things that are being done, other technologies that have appeared that are not referred to in the telecoms uh, reference paper. So taking a fresh view of the at the telecoms and trying to update it in terms of new services, new technology that exists, that now exists, that did not exist back in the 90s, is something that several members have referred to as uh, a, uh, a, a useful exercise. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Let me just ask a, a final time. Anybody else have any more questions? It looks like no. Victor, do you want to make a final wrap-up statement? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for all of the questions. Very, very interesting questions. And I'm sorry if I couldn't reply to all of them uh, uh, because basically of, of my position in the Secretariat. But not only that, I mean, this is a rev an evolving area. There is a lot, the more I read about this issue, the more I have question marks myself. But thank you for all of the questions. Very, very interesting. And I see that, you know, participants are following what is happening here in Geneva uh, in, a, uh, in a closed manner. Uh, and I would say, again, uh, whatever happens in the WTO, be it in the multilateral setting, be it in the uh, joint statement, is, is something that will point to the future. So this is a fascinating area that uh, I think deserves uh, our collective attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So um, 
I want to thank all the attendees. Thank you so much for participating and our co-organizers. Our next webinar is going to be on April 9th. Uh, again, open to all, and we'll be focusing on smart cities and data governance. Um, please uh, join us then, and we welcome any ideas that you have for webinars. Um, some of our best ideas have come from you, <laughs> so please don't hesitate to get in touch with us, and thank you again. All the best to everybody. Stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.